morning, which are the closing words of 2 Kings and, and 2 Chronicles, uh, he is very much uh, the man in the focus of the hour. He is pressing in on Jerusalem. And I thought maybe we'd start by reading the last uh, verses of both 2 Kings and Chronicles, and then I'm going to take you to the prophet Jeremiah to finish out our time this morning. <coughs> and uh, mainly because Jeremiah records a lot more of the detail of the actual uh, fall, and you get a little bit more of the sense of the chaos in Jerusalem as things come to a, a screeching halt. So we'll begin in 2 Kings. And let's see, we'll pick it up probably in chapter 24 and uh, begin with <coughs> Jehoiakim there. You'll remember we have uh, the four, the last four kings of, uh, of Judah, or the ones we'll be looking at. Josiah has died, and uh, his son was uh, put on. The throne by the people after his death in the battle with Egypt. Egypt then, in turn, after three months, uh, deposed uh, the king Jehoahaz and packed him off to Egypt, presumably because he was more loyal to Babylon than he was to Egypt, and Egypt wanted to make sure they had more of an ally. That will be interesting as you see in Jeremiah the tug of war between. Jeremiah saying, you submit to Babylon, things will go better for you. God's got this ordained. That's the way to go. And those within the city that said, no, our connection, our hope is in Egypt. And there was this great battle back and forth going through the politicians in the city. It began here with Jehoahaz being pulled out and Jehoiakim uh, being placed by Pharaoh. Jehoiakim is going to end up being packed off to Babylon because he wasn't loyal to them. And uh, we have Jehoiachin, his son, who lasts a whole three months before he is packed off to Babylon. And then finally Zedekiah, the final king that reigns in Jerusalem. So, And he also ends up in Babylon. So we'll begin in chapter 24 with Jehoiakim, who is uh, the one who is placed by Pharaoh, and in his days, in chapter 24, Nebuchadnezzar king of Babylon came up and Jehoi Jehoiakim became his servant for three years, and then he turned and rebelled against him. And the Lord sent against him bands of Chaldeans and Syrians and bands of Moabites and bands of Ammonites, so he sent them against Judah to destroy it. According to the word of the Lord, he had spoken to his servant, the prophets. So you can see that times are tough, not just with Babylon. They have enemies all over the place. Verse 3, Surely at the command of the Lord it came upon Judah to remove them from his sight because of the sins of Manasseh, according to all that he had done. And also for the innocent bloods which he shed, he filled Jerusalem with innocent blood, and the Lord would not forgive. Now the rest of the acts of Jehoiakim and all that he did, are they not written in the book of the Chronicles of the kings of Judah? So Jehoiakim slept with his fathers, and Jehoiachin, his son, became king in his place. And the king of Egypt did not come out of his land again, for the king of Babylon had taken all that belonged to the king of Egypt, from the brook of Egypt to the river Euphrates. And Jehoiachin was 18 years old when he became king, and he reigned three months in Jerusalem. And his mother's name was Nahushta, the daughter of El Nathan of Jerusalem. And he did evil in the sight of the Lord, according to all that his father had done. At that time, the servants of Nebuchadnezzar, king of Babylon, went up to Jerusalem, and the city came under siege. And Nebuchadnezzar, the king of Babylon, came to the city while his servants were besieging it. And Jehoiachin, the king of Judah, went out to the king of Babylon, he and his mother and his servants and his captains and his officials. So the king of Babylon took him captive in the eighth year of his reign. And he carried out from there all the treasures of the house of the Lord and the treasures of the king's house and cut in pieces all the vessels of gold which Solomon, king of Israel, had made in the temple of the Lord, just as the Lord had said. And he led away into exile all Jerusalem and all the captains and all the mighty men of valor, ten thousand captives and all the craftsmen and the smiths. None remained except the poorest people of the land. So he led Jehoiachin away into exile to Babylon, also the king's mother, 
and the king's wives and his officials and the leading men of the land, and he led away into exile from Jerusalem to Babylon. And all the men of valor, 7,000, and the craftsmen and the smiths, 1,000, all strong and fit for war, and these the king of Babylon brought into exile to Babylon. Then the king of Babylon made his uncle Mataniah king in his place and changed his name to Zedekiah. Zedekiah was 21 years old when he became king and he reigned 11 years in Jerusalem. And his mother's name was Hamutal, the daughter of Jeremiah of Libna. And he did evil in the sight of the Lord according to all that Je Je Jehoiakim had done. For through the anger of the Lord this came about in Jerusalem and Judah until he cast them out from his presence. Zedekiah rebelled against the king of Babylon. Just a quick side note, if you flip over to the, to the book of Daniel, it's interesting to read. In the third year of the reign of Jehoiakim, king of Judah, Nebuchadnezzar, king of Babylon, came to Jerusalem and besieged it. Just what we read about. And the Lord gave Jehoiakim, king of Judah, into his hand, along with some of the vessels of the house of the God. And he brought them to the land of Shinar, to the house of his God. And he brought the vessels into the treasury of his God. Then the king ordered Ashpenaz, the chief of his officials, to bring in some of the sons of Israel, including some of the royal family and of the nobles, youths in whom was no defect, who were good-looking, showing intelligence in every branch of wisdom, endowed with understanding and discerning knowledge, and who had ability for serving the king's court. And he ordered them to teach them the literature and language of the Chaldeans. And so on and so forth. Of verse 6, among them from the sons of Judah were Daniel, Hananiah, Mishael, and Azariah. And you probably know more famously as their names that have been changed to Shadrach, Meshach, and Abednego, which were their pagan names that were given to them by the Babylonians. So there is the beginnings of Daniel, or in the first captivity, the first exodus out of Judah that happened in the Jehoiakim. So may I help tie some of those clean pages of your Bible and those two things together a little bit. Let's read on chapter 25. Now it came about in the ninth year of his reign on the tenth day of the tenth month that Nebuchadnezzar king of Babylon came he and all his army against Jerusalem and camped against it and built a siege wall all around it. So the city was under siege until the eleventh year of King Zedekiah. And on the ninth day of the fourth month, the famine was so severe in the city that there was no food for the people of the land. And the city was broken into, and all the men of war fled by night by way of the gate between the two walls, which was by the king's garden. Though the Chaldeans were all around the city, and they went by way of the Arabah, but the army of the Chaldeans pursued the king and overtook him in the plains of Jericho, and all his army was scattered from him. And they captured the king and brought him to the king of Babylon at Riblah, and he passed sentence on him. Here's the sentence. And they slaughtered the sons of Zedekiah before his eyes, then put out the eyes of Zedekiah and bound him with bronze fetters and brought him to Babylon. On the seventh day of the fifth month, which was the nineteenth year of King Nebuchadnezzar, king of Babylon, Nebuchadnezzar, the captain of the guard, a servant of the king of Babylon, came to Jerusalem. And he burned the house of the Lord, the king's house, and all the houses of Jerusalem, and even every great house he burned with fire. So all the army of the Chaldeans who were with the captain of the guard broke down the walls around Jerusalem. And the rest of the people who were left in the city and the deserters who had deserted the king of Babylon and the rest of the multitude, Nebuzaradan, the captain of the guard, carried away into exile. But the captain of the guard left some of the poorest of the land to be vine dressers and plowmen. Now the bronze pillars which were in the house of the Lord and the stands and the bronze sea which were in the house of the Lord, Chaldeans broke in pieces and carried the bronze to Babylon. And they took away the pots, the shovels, the snuffers, the spoons, and all the bronze vessels that were used in the temple service. The captain of the guard also took away the fire pans, the basins, what was fine gold and what was fine silver, the two pillars, the one sea, the stands which Solomon had made for the house of the Lord. The bronze of all these vessels was beyond weight. The height of the one pillar was 18 cubits, and the bronze capital was on it. 
The height of the capital was three cubits with a network of pomegranates on the capital all around, all of bronze. And the second pillar was like these with network. Then the captain of the guard took Sariah the chief priest and Zephaniah the second priest with three officials of the temple. And from the city he took one official who was overseer, the men of war, and five of the king's advisors who were found in the city, and the scribe of the captains of the army who mustered the people of the land, and sixty men of the people of the land who were found in the city. And Nebuzaradan, the captain of the guard, took them and brought them to the king of Babylon at Riblah. And the king of Babylon struck them down and put them to death at Riblah in the land of Hamath. So Judah was led away into exile from its land. As for the people who were left in the land of Judah, whom Nebuchadnezzar, king of Babylon, had left, he appointed Gedaliah, the son of Ahikam, the son of Shaphan, over them. And all the captains of the forces, they and their men, heard that the king of Babylon had appointed Gedaliah governor. They came to Gedaliah to Mizpah, namely Ishmael, the son of Nethaniah, and Johanan, the son of Kariah, and Sariah, the boy, the son of Tan Humeth, I'm sure I'm slaughtering his name. <laughs> the Netophathite, and Jazzeraniah, the son of Amahakathite, they and their men. And Gedaliah swore to them and their men and said to them, Do not be afraid of the servants of the Chaldeans. Live in the land and serve the king of Babylon, and it will be well with you. But it came about in the seventh month that Ishmael, the son of Nethaniah, the son of Elishama, of the royal family, came with ten men and struck Gedaliah down so that he died along with the Jews and the Chaldeans who were with him in this spot. And all the people, both small and great, and the captains of the forces arose and went to Egypt, for they were afraid of the Chaldeans. And it came about in the thirty-seventh year of the exile of Jehoiachin, king of Judah, in the twelfth month, on the twenty-seventh day of the month, that evil Merodach, king of Babylon, in the year that he became king, released Jehoiachin, king of Judah, from prison. He spoke kindly to him, set his throne above the throne of the kings who were with him in Babylon, and Jehoiachin changed his prison clothes and had his meals in the king's presence regularly all the days of his life. And for his allowance, a regular allowance was given him by the king and a portion for each day all the days of his life. So there we have King's version of the winding up of affairs. And you can see, I hope you get the sense as we read through this kind of rapidly, if you didn't get all the names and then the absolute mess, chaos times that they had. Last time we talked about what siege looks like in a city. And of the starvation and the disease and the, all the filth and everything that they endured. And it's hard as you go through this to understand and get a grasp of what the city looked like and what the situation was at the, at the end of this period. But if you think back to 2001, in September, and you remember those shots, what downtown New York City looked like after the Trade Center came down, with all the smoke coming up and the wreckage and the things sticking out all over, imagine an entire city that you have grown up in that was your, not just your city where you live, but the city of your nation and the place where you went to worship and the whole thing looks like that. Every major building has been either burned or razed. They've gone around the city after they punched the hole through with the battering ram the first time that allowed them into the city. They've gone around and they've torn down gaping holes in the walls all the way around the city of Jerusalem. So it's wide open. You can come and go from almost any place. There's no security there anymore. And it's just a smoking pile of rubble with a few starving, straggling people wandering through the city. That's what Nebuchadnezzar has left behind him. So if you grasp that just a little tiny bit, that's kind of the... Now there's that little bit of hope at the end there with the, uh, the bringing Jehoiachin out of prison and kind of putting him back into a little better place. And of course, as you go into Daniel and the others, you'll find that there's, there's even more hope for the restoration of the nation. But right now, it's pretty gloomy. Uh, it might just be worth our while to run through Chronicles. It's a little shorter version. 
Uh, chapter 36 is it's all crammed into one chapter, so maybe we just read through that, give a, kind of a priest's viewpoint on uh, the comings and goings. It says, Then the people of the land took Jehoahaz, this is after <coughs> Jeho Josiah has died, and took Jehoahaz and made him king in place of his father of Jerusalem. Jehoahaz was 23 years old when he became king, and he reigned three months in Jerusalem. Then the king of Egypt deposed him in Jerusalem and imposed on the land a fine of 100 talents of silver and one talent of gold. And the king of Egypt made Eliakim his brother king over Judah and Jerusalem and changed his name to Jehoiakim. But Necho took Jehoahaz his brother and brought him to Egypt. And Jehoiakim was 25 when he became king and he reigned 11 years in Jerusalem and he did evil in the sight of the Lord his God. And Nebuchadnezzar, king of Babylon, came up against him and bound him with bronze chains to take him to Babylon. And Nebuchadnezzar also brought some of the articles of the house of the Lord to Babylon and put them in the, his temple at Babylon. Very possibly the temple that you saw the depiction of there with it on top of the tower. And the rest of the acts of Jehoiakim and the abominations which he did and what was found against him, behold, they are written in the book of the kings of Israel and Judah. And Jehoiachin, his son, became king in his place. Jehoiachin, here it says eight. It was actually 18. There was an overlap in reign with his father, probably. So eight years old when he became king, he reigned three months and ten days in Jerusalem, and he did evil in the sight of the Lord. And at the turn of the year, King Nebuchadnezzar sent and brought him to Babylon with the valuable articles of the house of the Lord. And he made his kinsman Zedekiah, his uncle actually, king over Judah and Jerusalem. Zedekiah was 21 years old when he became king, and he reigned 11 years in Jerusalem, and he did evil in the sight of the Lord his God. He did not humble himself before Jeremiah the prophet who spoke for the Lord. And he also rebelled against King Nebuchadnezzar, who had made him swear allegiance by God. But he stiffened his neck and hardened his heart against turning to the Lord God of Israel. Furthermore, all the officials, the priests, and the people were very unfaithful, following all the abominations of the nations, and they defiled the house of the Lord, which he had sacrificed <laughs> in Jerusalem. Sacrificed, sanctified in Jerusalem. I get this right. So they defiled the house again, and the Lord, the God of their fathers, sent word to them again and again by his messengers, Jeremiah, Ezekiel, and others because he had compassion on his people and on his dwelling place. But they continually mocked the messengers of God, he despised his words, and scoffed at his prophets, until the wrath of the Lord rose against his people, until there was no remedy. Therefore he brought up the king of the Chaldeans, who slew their young men with the sword in the house of their sanctuary, and had no compassion on young man or virgin, old man or infirm. He gave them all into his hand. And all the articles of the house of God, great and small, and the treasures of the house of the Lord, and the treasures of the king and his officers, he brought them all to Babylon. And they burned the house of God, and broke down the wall of Jerusalem, and burned all its fortified buildings with fire, and destroyed all its valuable articles. And those who had escaped from the sword he carried away to Babylon, and they were servants to him and his sons until the rule of the kingdom of Persia. To fulfill the word of the Lord by the mouth of Jeremiah until the land had enjoyed its Sabbath. All the days of its desolation it kept Sabbath until seventy years were complete. And in the first year of Cyrus, king of Persia, in order to fulfill the word of the Lord by the mouth of Jeremiah, the Lord stirred up the spirit of Cyrus, king of Persia, so that he sent a proclamation throughout his kingdom and also put it in writing, saying, Thus says the king of Persia, the Lord, the God of heaven, has given me all the kingdoms of the earth, and he has appointed me to build him a house in Jerusalem, which is in Judah. Whoever there is among you, all his people, and the Lord his God be with him, and let him go up. And you can connect that one to Nehemiah. So here's all the connection with some of the pieces that are going to come together. I have a question on yeah. Nehemiah 10 and verse 9. Mm -hmm. He was eight years old when he became king, mm -hmm. and he reigned three months and ten days in Jerusalem, and he did what was evil in the sight of the Lord. So he only reigned 
three months, he was still eight years old. Actually, when you look at Kings, it says 18. And what the, I'll have to take the expert's word for, what they believe took place was he was 18 when he took over being king by himself. That he was eight years old when his father brought him in and had a co-regency with him for 10 years. Okay. So he kind of was there 10 years, but his father was still looked at as the king. And then there was three months that he was king by himself and nobody was happy with him. Yeah. yeah, it was a short reign. There were a number of really short reigns. Gives you a little sense of the upheaval of the nation. And for having looking at kings, and we still say 11 years. Man, that's a long time. Gosh, 11 years. Can I remember back 11 years? Now that really stretches our memory. We're used to presidency less fraction of that. So it's really hard for us to get our minds around when you've had kings for 40 years and now you have them for 11 or you have them, and when you got them for three months. Uh, you know, we aren't told just what the upheaval and the turmoil is exactly on a lot of this, but you know, it had to be a mess. Who's in charge? Who's running the show? And uh, as we kind of wind up here, I wanted to take you just a few little blips into Jeremiah. In some homework for you, you can go into Jeremiah and pick it up in about chapter 37. It's where you go, a lot of Jeremiah is written as poetry as, and illustration and trying to illustrate for the nation all his judgments as well as his mercy that's available and trying to coax uh, the leaders and the people to turn around and change their way. He's also been telling them, Babylon is coming, you submit to Babylon, it will go well with you if you don't submit, the city's going to be burned. That's our repeated message through there. Uh, but when he gets to this chapter, then it suddenly changes a little bit and you get bits and pieces of history. And you really have the last days of uh, the, the city of Jerusalem kind of uh, set out for you. And um, it gives you maybe a little more insight into the instability politically and into this guy Zedekiah. It was there 11 years, but you'll find Zedekiah was a real wishy-washy leader. He would come out and make strong statements, bold things, and then when his the leaders within the nation, those power brokers that worked around, yeah, the king's word was kind of final, and yet there's these guys that put their pressure on the king, and he would cave in every time. And I really suspect that a lot of what happened and the reason he got into trouble with Babylon is because while he might want to listen to what Jeremiah is saying, when the elders put pressure on him saying, our hope is in Egypt, he would cave in and go that way. And it cost him dearly. It cost him his family and it cost him his eyes. So uh, we'll see. Uh, a little bit of what uh, he's been telling them in the beginning of chapter 38. If you look at verse 2, this is what Jeremiah is telling the people. Thus says the Lord, He who stays in this city will die by the sword and by famine and by pestilence. Well, those words show up all the time. And I'm in chapter 38 again, verse 2 there, if you're catching up with me. And he who goes out to the Chaldeans will live and have his own life as booty and stay alive. Thus says the Lord, this city will certainly be given into the hand and the army of the king of Babylon, and he will capture it. And here's what the officials are saying to the king. Listen to this little vignette here. The officials said to the king, Now let this man be put to death inasmuch as he is discouraging the men of war who are left in this city and all the people by speaking such words to them, for this man is not seeking the well-being of this people, but rather their harm. And here's powerful, strong King Zedekiah. Behold, he is in your hands, for the king can do nothing against you. Oh, I couldn't trust you guys. I depend on you guys. And they took Jeremiah, cast him into the cistern of Malchijah, the king's son, which is in the court of the guardhouse, and they let Jeremiah down with ropes. In the cistern, there's no water, but only mud, and he sank into the mud. Now he's rescued by... Ebed Milek, the Ethiopian, 
and who is a eunuch within the palace. And you can, on your own time, I'll let you read through that story. But I want you to see how this takes place again, because it gives you a little insight into Zedekiah, what's going on. Why is the king of Babylon having such trouble with him? It's because this guy goes to him in verse 9, and he says, My lord, the king, these men have acted wickedly, and all that they have done to Jeremiah the prophet, whom they have cast in the cistern, and he will die right where he is because of the famine, for there is no more bread in the city. And then the king commands Ebed Melech, the Ethiopian, take 30 men from here under your authority and bring Jeremiah out of the cistern before he dies. You just gave your guys authority to get rid of him. Now, oh gee, well, gosh, yeah, that would be bad. I don't know, Jeremiah, he's kind of God's guy. So they pull him back out, and they put him in the court of the guardhouse. And in verse 14, Zedekiah sends for him. And he had him brought to him at the third entrance that is in the house of the Lord. See, the king says to Jeremiah, I'm going to ask you something. Don't hide anything from me. So you got to tell me. And of course, he says, the answer is, well, if I tell you, what you're going to put me to death? And so, oh, no. Verse 16, but King Zedekiah swore to Jeremiah in secret, saying, as the Lord lives who made this life for us, surely I will not put you to death, nor will I give you over to the hand of these men who are seeking your life. Just dead. But, he gets the same message, go out, be okay, don't listen, you die. And so what does he do? He tells him, in verse 24, okay, well here's what we're going to do in order so that you and I don't get into trouble. Let no man know about these words and you will not die. In other words, you don't tell anybody that I called you here. You don't tell anybody what you said. And if anybody asks you anything, you're to tell them in verse 26, I was presenting my petition for the king not to make me return to the house of Jonathan to die there, which is the dungeon. So he said, don't send me back to the dungeon. That's what you're supposed to ask for. So they stick him in the house of arrest in the court of the guardhouse until the day Jerusalem was captured. Get this guy, Zedekiah. In, which wants to listen, wants to believe what this guy's saying, and wants to hear it, and yet he doesn't want to hear it. And when the finally day, the day comes when the army is busting through the walls, and all the officials tell us in 39 that the king of Babylon, they came and they set up right in the middle of the city. It says, came in, sat down by the middle gate, and it gives all their names in verse 3 of chapter 39. And king of Judah and all the men of war saw them. And what has he been told by Jeremiah the prophet? Go down, submit to Babylon, you'll get your life. That's good. You will be preserved. What does he do? He escapes by the gate with his army and tries to outrun them and get down to the Jordan and escape. And he gets caught. The rest of the and Jerusalem falls, and then, then from there it just descends into chaos as the governor that's appointed is killed, and, is, and they flee to Egypt. Jeremiah, the last we hear of him, he's in Egypt, and you will see a prophecy that the, the king of Babylon is going to come down and take Egypt, and that will be the last of their security. So, wow, that's fascinating history as we wind up. This passage, I encourage you to go through and read this passages of Jeremiah and just see these, the mess that the things are in as it closes. And uh, the last words of Jeremiah are recorded there, I think it's in chapter 41, as he gives them the last time a reminder about their God and their need to be faithful to Him. So what? Great history. Fascinating story war and turmoil and things being turned upside down. Did you catch who did it? Who did all this? Destruction. This is the place God said, I'm going to put my name forever. And yet he, is it there forever? 
give them every chance. Yeah. Time and time again. Time and time, time and time, time again. Okay. Just couldn't get it. And as we sum it up, you got to go back and hear in my filing cabinet, as I was told, which is true. I got my little pink piece of paper that I put down way back in Samuel when they dedicated the temple, which is linked all the way back to Deuteronomy and Leviticus when God first set up the agreement with the nation of Israel and said, here's the deal, guys. You want to dwell in the land. Here's what you got to do. And there were seven petitions that Solomon asked for, and the very last one says, when we find ourselves in captivity because of sin, here's what we ask. Will you forgive? Will you make us objects of your compassion? And will you restore us? Will you bring us back? He got this, okay? When you have failed, when you find yourself in captivity, I will be faithful to that. And what's interesting, did you see the setup? I kind of went by it fast. I took you back to Daniel. You know why I took you there? There's the setup. In the second captivity, guess who gets packed off with them? You can go check it out. Ezekiel's in the second one. Ezekiel and Daniel. And what are their prophecies about? <coughs> well, some of it is their restoration back, as you just read about, that the, that the Persians take over and they send everybody back and they rebuild the temple. Zerubbabel's temple is rebuilt. It's all pointing back and it points to the future. And in fact, those of, when we go back into our New Testament at Christmas time, where do we go? We go back to those guys. The ones that God pulled out, took in that awful camel train you know, with all the other people that were enslaved and everything else, and drug them back to Babylon, and then placed his people in his place, and some of that's yet to come. Some of the things that these guys predicted was fulfilled with the Messiah, and some of them are yet to happen. And so even in the midst of this catastrophe, God himself brought about, he's planted the seeds of what is even our future, yeah. which is just amazing grace. It's fascinating that we can read how God's word is fulfilled, so we have positive hope for the things that are yet in the future that are coming back. Well, you can look at those things those guys talked about, and they happen, some of them within years, sometimes even sooner than that. In the case of Jeremiah, it was a matter of months or days that what he said happened. With other things further, further down the road, and with other things that we've not yet seen. So those of you can document our assurance of those things that we have not yet seen. So, uh, yeah. But it'd be nice to know. There it is! <laughs> yeah. Is this it? Is it setting up? You gotta wonder. Yeah. Is this what we wrote about? So it's supposed to give us hope and encouragement in the world. Well, that's the end of our, our trail here. Next time, we're going to take a Kind of, we're still being in the same place where we can take a little different turn as we go into the book of Lamentations. I have not spent a lot of time in Lamentations before, but it's a fascinating book, very different from what we've been in. It's not so much historical, though it's based on this very event, but it's written in poetics, it's written the structure and the, and the words that are in there take you through, if you will, the grief process of one who has seen everything they had hoped for crumble in their, right in their lap, right in the middle of them, and dealing with that, and how you handle the grief that comes out of that loss and that reversal and that change, 
and how you come out the other end. And fascinating, as I got into it, it's really interesting. I hope I don't bore you to get into it too badly. But we're going to take a little look at Lamentations, and then we'll figure out where we go from there. So, let's go. Father, we thank you for our time together this morning. As we see the winding up of the nation of Judah, as uh, the world had known it, and their uh, absolute destruction and deportation, help us not to lose sight of the fact that this was as hard as it is to understand for their good. That they were headed the wrong way so hard that they were uh, unreachable any other way. And some indeed probably lost their lives having never turned back and never having seen uh, the promise of their redemption. And yet others, uh, through this captivity and through the testimony of those who uh, had turned the corner and would return to the land and who even looked forward uh, even further to the coming of a Messiah and for His reign. Father, we just pray that uh, You would give us eyes to see that You do this with an eye towards their good and towards our good. That the hope that we have is based uh, in the hope that they have. And the grace that's poured out for them uh, as Gentiles, we are uh, able to share in that because of what the Savior did on the cross for all of us. We thank you that we now, who were outside of the promise and outside of the family, are adopted in and we are now called children, sons of God. And we thank you for that great privilege. Help us in our own uh, reversals and our own battles to uh, recognize your hand and be able to give you praise and look for your grace. We thank you, Father, in Jesus' name.